uh, you know, forcing machine learning on them, but actually showing them some of the exciting applications that you can do and, you know, seeing it as a career path. Uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, one great way to get this applied for real challenging problems would be for the practitioner to visit those who need and will use it to gather empathy. Let's like go to the townships or go to the taxi ranks maybe, talk to the people, gather empathy, and that kind of generates a lot many more ideas. Because ideas can come from anywhere. So and the more ideas that come, the more well understood the problem gets, and that kind of helps in designing these black boxes which we call machine. I think that uh, days like this is, is great. Many people are doing different things on their own or in small groups, and we don't always know what other people are doing. And getting together and telling other people what you're doing, and uh, in that way we can learn from one another and, and uh, build the community, and then as a community get more people involved. Um, I think we need more local data. Um, we've got unique faces, unique languages, unique uh, uh, geographics. We've got unique lack of connectivity. Um, and um, that's a problem. And I think, um, I don't think we've got facial recognition for applicants. Do we? Do we have a data set? Do we have a, I think we need a cable for applicants. Um, There's actually one being established. No, uh, I fully agree. Um, I, I, the reason I founded MIA, Machine Intelligence of Africa, was also to network together um, people that's interested, data scientists, I know, anybody interested to use these smart technologies to solve problems um, and to help transform Africa as well. I'm so inspired by deep learning and knowledge. Well, last year's event, the, the, it's South Africans that sits in deep learning, uh, a deep mind, and, and Google brain that was really behind that and pulled the muscle. And, and that event was awesome. And at the back of that event, we got Mia, also the IBM Hackathon, where we've got 100 people, close to 100 people, and um, well, these guys, Alex and Chris, was fantastic in terms of that. And that was exciting. We, we actually had a lot of really good diversity there as well, so which is really awesome. But, but I think one needs to think big here. We don't want to get left behind. So we need to think about, we've got new government leadership and so forth. Uh, I know Cyril and have talked about mm -hmm. Um, the fourth industrial revolution and those type of things. So I think we need to get government, local governments involved. Um, it needs to be like a national strategy. If you think about uh, what's happening in China, what's happening in France, what's happening um, in many places, Canada and so forth, they, they're thinking big, they realize what's going on. Um, and, and, I, and I think we need to get this into school curriculums. My son is here, we need to get it to the kids when he's 15 years old. He's doing Python and Keras and all that kind of stuff. And it, Excited by this, uh, he's doing MD maths. If he can do that, he does computer science. So why can't we get those those kind of people involved? We shouldn't just be, we, should, we should maybe think about expectations from strangers. We should just say let's remove it. Um, and anyway, so there's, there's a few other things that I've got listed here. Uh, I just wanted to say we actually in terms of strengthening today we had a guy by you. Um, um, uh, you met him, Akadami here. He's a very he's actually the chief transformation officer of MT in Nigeria and he head up the data science Nigeria um, and he's really behind that and we are also collaborating with him. But I'm quite inspired by what he is doing in Nigeria. And we can follow his lead. He's building a closed loop ecosystem around that. Basically taking people from having no knowledge to right through to being um, uh, on boot camps, getting the Turns, getting their jobs, mentoring, all of that, and, it, and it's, it's very inspiring. We need those kind of uh, leadership. So I think Ames, Mia, all these, we, we need to work together to establish the same kind of thing. Sorry. Great. You know, all, all ready, ready, great answer. They're all longer than two sentences. We're all very good answers. <laughs> I think yeah. you have time. No, we have more time. In fact, we can go until 7.30. If people want to leave, please don't feel like you're being rude. Um, yeah. I just want to mention one thing. Right? <laughs> 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 because it's maybe fits in with this question. NASPERS is doing something exciting and it's great to see that. 
we were going to talk about Nasper's labs, and we talk about a thousand labs across the country, positioned in rural areas as well, and they talk about AI-based learning. And we eventually, made, I think, Portage Logic became involved also with AI-based learning, but forget about that. Nasper is, is putting money behind this, and it's all kind of a social non-profit course, which is, for me, fantastic. It's, it's great that corporates in South Africa is, is taking that leadership. So, so if we look at other corporates, why can't we use money in a proper way to actually do that? Because that, that is a great initiative. Great, yeah, I mean, um, I, I totally agree on all of the above, especially the open data sets. I, I urge anyone from companies to consider releasing data sets as challenges. Um, I think that's, I mean, there's this great talk by Peter Golding, the director of research at Google, called Unreasonable Effectiveness of Big Data. And he just shows that like more data is always better than a uh, better algorithm. You know, like a simple algorithm, lots of data can, can do very, very well. Um, and also the connectivity thing is a problem because even though there are free Stanford courses on deep learning on YouTube, if MTN is going to extort you uh, on the data costs, then you know, uh, I think a lot of that's cartel pricing and it costs us bringing that down. But I think that'll also be a big deal. Uh, but yeah, the data sets, if you could please get some data sets published, that would be great. And I think also it's important to like share them all in one place because right now it's, they're all over the place. There's interesting blockchain stuff and open data, but it's a bit frustrating that you have to like, you know, find some janky FTP server, and, you know, like we get to have these all in one place, especially around Africa. So we can maybe use some of the resources around the deep learning data to create a centralized, at least a listing, if not a repository. Okay, cool. Um, so sort of, Twitter-sized answer <laughs> <laughs> to your 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 favorite example of uh, yeah before they extended the limit your favorite example of uh, applied artificial intelligence in Africa. I mean, you can elaborate a, a little bit, but but just like a short short favorite example. I mean, maybe the first one who has one can say because I see people thinking very hard. Hopefully, I'm trying to make it concise. <laughs> Any, any any ideas in your favorite example of applied artificial intelligence machine learning in Africa? I have one here. Yes. Yeah, okay. It's not. I think it's not that shotgun. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, excuse me for taking one from our lab, but um, uh, we were searching the genome for correlation between genes and uh, cancer metastasis, so the spread of the spread of of cancer, correlated genes in certain complicated ways. And there was a very African one that was found, um, um, which links the spread of cancer to uh, malaria resistance. Mm. So that was a sad thing, you know, that having malaria resistance uh, leads to slightly uh, higher chance of certain cancers. But it does show, it raises the point, that uh, you have to ask these questions, uh, which are very locally sensitive, uh, uh, Contextual, they're very contextual. So that's why uh, another bug, I didn't pick to, uh, to put a, um, a research lab in Africa because we want to ask these questions and with this knowledge and power ourselves with knowledge to, to tackle the problem. Um, I guess also, uh, very quick, um, John, John Quinn has a, a project he's working with UN Pulse in Makarere, also with Thomas Niesler. And uh, they're building speech systems to basically monitor radio broadcasts in Uganda for things like uh, figuring out um, when a disaster happens, how it spreads over the country. Um, he's actually got a whole bunch of super interesting applications, specifically in Uganda. Uganda's got a big traffic problem and like building practical systems for just tracking traffic. Um, there's a whole bunch of very interesting things coming from there. Um, there was some work on uh, how can we use uh, low cost sensor to detect counterfeit drugs mm -hmm. in the world. Is that an actual question? Yeah. Wow. Can you give a one sentence more? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what country? So, counterfeit drug is a big problem we all know. And if you want to test if certain drug is genuine or counterfeit, you have to send it for animal analysis. And the easier way can be to take a very low cost act, 
spectroscope, but instead of trying to recognize the molecules, had to match the spectroscope with the spectroscopic image of the real drug. And we have got a short YouTube video on how that can work. On the just Maybe. search in YouTube on counterfeit drugs. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to be on a list if you do that. <laughs> Just a warning. I don't really have any software here. I'll be very short of course. That's true. Yeah. I think I'm not sure if it's AI, but that the board scanner that I think was developed here at UCT, where the was developed for um, for diamond uh, detecting uh, stone diamonds, but then it developed into a medical application. Uh, we, if you are in an accident, uh, then they can scan your whole body uh, immediately sure. um, at the ER. Like soccer. And it was a uh, Oh, cool. <laughs>
Can you elaborate? So how would you, would you just blow it all on mechanical turf? Like how do you, how do you so, get it? Not so much the labeling, but um, like for example, facial uh, <coughs> Um I think that's something that's really lacking in the African context. Um, I think um, text resources, um, uh, for example, uh, educational resources for all 11 African, uh, all 11 South African languages um, to, to create the, the, the resources because it doesn't exist. I think that's a big thing is that those uh, data resources does not exist in the, on the same scale um, than uh, international resources. Yeah, it seems like there, there might be some sort of mechanism by which you can capture that data as a byproduct of something that's already happening. Like, right? you know, maybe you can get call centers that are made available from government call centers and then how to say might be but, but yeah. Well, what? So unlimited budget? budget. <laughs> <laughs> Use dollars? <laughs> I, I would, I would really focus on similar to what we do with Portage Logic. I, 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 I would focus on end-to-end -end solutions that's actually making an impact. And you've got to have data. You've got to have. You, if you don't have the data, you put the infrastructure in place. So the way I'm looking at this is um, that you need a rock-solid, solid data infrastructure and. You can have beautiful infrastructure, but there's no data, structure, construction, you can do nothing. Um, so, so that's absolutely critical. So connectivity is, is critical. It's, um, so in our solutions, we actually look at a whole ecosystem of partners that can help put end-to-end -end solutions together. Obviously, we can't do everything, so, but we want to fill in the gaps and, and make sure that we can embed an AI engine there to actually create this end-to-end -end solution. So I would dedicate a team on those type of things. And, Healthcare, education, think about the big picture things, uh, big ticket items um, for Africa as well. So you want to start solving those. Structure into our machine learning models. So 
think your example is also an example of that, like picking one thing and you know drawing in expertise from all over the country that's focusing on that. Uh, threw me off as the low hanging fruit part because <laughs> <laughs> that was a good answer. That I had a page that um, it's doable, and, and so I haven't got an answer for the low hanging fruit part. But uh, if I would pick uh, topics that need attention, well, first I pick a topic that needs attention uh, AI and ethics. Um, a lot more work needs to be put into um, techniques for um, taking data sets and moving and discriminatory bias. So um, if you look at, in the, unfortunately we don't have a problem yet in South Africa, but like in the US they use AI to decide on uh, prison sentences. Mm -hmm. And there's some horror stories there that they show that these systems, they're learning from data. Mm -hmm. But of course the data is biased. Right. And biased in a way that we would, first of all, it shows that, you know, what an unequal society we live in. But it doesn't mean you should act on that. Just because there's a correlation between someone's race and the prison sentence doesn't mean now you use that as a, as a, as a, as a feature to predict. Uh, so it's, it's a really serious issue. And well, um, Although, I mean, uh, have you seen, did you read that Danny Kahneman Thinking Past the Slow book? Yeah, by Pablo? very good. This has been on how pretty much linearly with the amount of time since the first date, the parole rates like decline, the like, parole granting rates. So like, if you're up for parole, you want to go straight after lunch, basically, because like as gets hungry, but right. so maybe then there's a counter argument that you know humans no. have these built-in biases, so then you know maybe a model, but then it's like which one least biased, and then you know, the model may be less biased, but now you're deciding like the self-driving car when you kill fewer people, but now the the is or the blame is on them, whereas you know individual. So I'm not saying AI is bad. I'm saying we just need to in, uh, research techniques. In fact, um, at the um, I do think uh, conference last week or week before, they picked this particular topic as one of the biggest contributions. In fact, they made this prediction that if AI doesn't solve this problem, uh, but the AIs that don't solve the problem will die out. They, they won't be used. So, so, and they gave an example of one way they have. They to take the take a data distribution and um, pick sensitive variables that you want to unlearn the correlations from, and then you can use. Uh, Corbett Library uh, divergence and and remove the bias. So that there are techniques. So yes, we must AI is better than humans in some situations. Uh, so by all means let's use AI, but then be cognizant of these problems and then research them and solve them. So that's the uh, that's I think the algorithm that was presented at this conference uh, is doable and it's and we're just not doing it, we're just not interested in it enough. Um, and we as Africans we should we should really be pushing it. Uh, we know um, our local environment, we have to be going after data mm. uh, and then being aware of these issues. And we, we, have, we, we have the Feasible Sport Movement, we're really tackling with these issues. Uh, so we should be in the forefront. And then if I had to pick one topic that's not, um, uh, that's definitely not working in crude, I would pick quantum, uh, quantum machine learning. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that it could be low hanging and high hanging at the same time. <laughs> 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 And, and what I did say in my talk was um, this could uh, this could really bring a spin to the machine learning side of things. Uh, the, uh, to to uh, AI, it could be the one thing that that makes AI, you know, uh, solve beyond the path of the super AI stuff. But I haven't been to the yeah, but so so like you say that because computing were an increase and you know, that would mean that our models would be better. Um, I mean, if I were to briefly answer the question, I'd say like, firstly, if you were ready for the biggest impact, I think you can get like very intro like undergrad software engineers, and they'll probably have a much better impact than like math people. Because math people simply don't know how to use GitHub, they don't know how to use real programming languages. <laughs> 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 Like, are you joking? <laughs> so, uh, no offense, just kidding. Take offense, but I tried it. No, thank you, David. It's alright. So, Peter's gonna hate while he uses stupid brackets around their loops and stuff. Um, okay, next question. R or Python? <laughs> oh, yes. 
bought the T-shirt. Myself bought the T-shirt. Is anything wrong? Oh. <laughs>
So we need to be more, more proactive in solving it. And I think a lot of the solution should be around, um, like what Ivan is doing, it should be augmentation, think about a doctor, or um, how do you work with the tools? Do you create roles around this? And focus more on empathy, empathy dealing with humans, um, and make that valuable. Teaching should be valuable, it should be paid, it should have more. Um, and, and we should think differently about so many different roles. And, and then, yeah, so it, it's a big problem that needs to be solved. Diversity, it's uh, it, education, as you said, um, we make that education free. We need to think aggressively about this. Connectivity everywhere. I mean, we need to invest in the right things. Infrastructure. Trump is trying to invest in infrastructure and also these. But we need to think about. Yeah, it's right. Yeah, I know. But, but, but for, for Africa, we don't want to be left behind here. I, I'm concerned about that as an Africa, as Africa, we, we can be left behind and competing with other big countries that's putting incredible amounts of money behind us. Um, so, you want to add? I think I'll touch upon two very pragmatic uh, ways of answering this query. First thing is that sometimes as a hobby, I go to the township schools to teach kids science and math to inspire them. Kids in sixth and eighth grade can divide four by two. How do you expect them to go and learn machine learning? It's, it's all very nice to tell them things, but primary education in this country is upshot. Second uh, pragmatic uh, way of looking at this thing, okay, let us forget primary education, focus only on university. I'm from electrical engineering. All the non-white students get a very good job of uh, from things like ESCOM. And that's why the white students are forced to think to start up their own business. And that is why what you told, you look at these startups dealing with machine learning, they look like you know, So it is not by design. So okay, how do you solve it? Do you stop giving jobs to the non-white students? No. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I'll mention uh, there's a startup called Sia Bula. I don't, I don't know what they're up to these days, but uh, I was trying to mark a while ago, and um, they kind of have this knowledge graph of the full school syllabus. I think there's interesting stuff there around like the student can you know, ask questions, and then we can construct a representation of what they understand, and then fill in the gaps in a sort of automated way. I think, and then you could localize it to the language. I think there's a lot of interesting stuff that could be done there. Which machine learning? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yes. So, so, um, yeah. um, yes, tell me. 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 Yes, tell You're supposed to be on time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so bring a chair. Oh, yeah. No, no, that's fine. Looking at my journey, my exposure to, I mean, I did artificial intelligence at, I mean, at university, and at that level, it was maybe the way they taught it, it was just over my head at that time. But then I did an internship soon after my undergrad, and that sparked a huge interest. And yes. from there, I fell in love with machine learning. So I think internship um, opportunities are very great just for exposure, mm -hmm. and then maybe then we'll see an increase. Because I think there is truth to that. A lot of students, um, maybe not, but a lot of that students after undergrad, they tend to then go work in industry and move away from furthering the studies. But I think if we can spark that interest and in, uh, the potential of artificial intelligence and see how we can then start you know, um, changing their mindset into becoming designers and program solvers. So we'll, we'll, I think we'll then get a lot of students going into furthering the studies and then joining machine learning companies and so so. So you got that from an internship. Well, I, yeah. I guess the, the one question is, can we change the way we, t we teach machine learning in an undergrad or a postgrad yes. level to actually spark that interest? Because I, I agree with you. I think I, I've sat in two types of machine learning courses. The one where it's very mathy and I'm dying and I don't understand what's going on. Okay, And the other one where it's super applied, um, where it's just like I'm doing the SK Learn tutorial, right? And just training a bunch of stuff, which is exciting. Um, but the right thing is something in the middle, and then the, the ideal thing is to do exactly what happens to you, like to spark that interest in some way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I'll, 
I'll say that uh, what, I, what I mentioned earlier on like having the biggest impact, just get some software engineers who know how to code repos. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there's a huge gap between companies' ability to find talent. Um, and, you know, so I, I think um, companies could benefit hugely by offering internships, and that could, of course, find education. So I think someone just needs to sort of middleman that relationship. I would suggest everyone in the audience who has a company, like please email like maybe us or the, the Indaba thing, and, and we can definitely announce those internships and get people filled on those. I'll also, this is my next question. I see some people want to ask questions. We'll do uh, questions to come from the audience shortly. Um, I want to quickly bring something up, and then maybe you can incorporate this in your answers. We can go for questions from the audience. I'm okay to run over a bit. Are you guys, anyone has to be the seven? Yes. Okay, cool. We can continue with our <laughs> we'll, we'll try. We'll try to get through the questions up that we, we have to ask now. So I'll just bring up this one thing, and, and maybe you can address some of, some of what we've been discussing and what we'll get to question. Um, so I just want to bring up, I mean, BCX is not a sponsor. But I understand some people from BCX are here. But I actually saw uh, an announcement like a couple months ago, BCX uh, investing 50 million rand in the Data Science Academy. So they're training 300 interns uh, over the next three years, sort of future-proof executives, and, and, and try to bring some of those skills into industry, into South Africa, and especially into African hands. Um, uh, any any thoughts on that, or you know, if, if you were to be able to set up an internship program, what would you make it look like, uh, or what are your thoughts on, on, on these these topics in general? How to strengthen machine learning in Africa being the theme we need to uh, think about. Yes. Um, I don't know if you know about the CISA or uh, the sign program. Mm -hmm. So. Um, CISA or uh, uh, sponsored by uh, Science and Technology has got a vacation program. So they take um, final year and then honors, masters, and PhD. But it's, uh, so it's a vacation program. But then what they do is they, they have these uh, project teams. Um, so it's, um, say, two to three students working on a real problem for three weeks and they have been but they, they, it's so multidisciplinary. So they have, for example, a journalist um, uh, a student, they've got a graphical design student, and then, of course, the engineering statistics, etc. And then they present, and they've got a show and tell at the end of the vacation program. And I think that makes a whole, you know, I think it's the same um, exposure that you had. And the nice thing about it is because I think it's difficult to clone an internship experience um, in a degree uh, because it's got different objectives. Uh, students want to pass, they want to, it's something that they want to finish. If you are in an internship, your KPIs uh, KPI are completely different. And that design program actually replicates um, an internship but in a three-week vacation space. And I think that's a good uh, model. Yeah, yeah, we should try to get the link. In so the Corsi, um, the Corsi is the yeah, leader. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, well, I'm sure they're pushing it anyway. But that, that's great. Yeah, so, so maybe one thing to just add on to, to maybe think about is, like, why can't some homework assignments be, like, internship projects? Like, why are there all these, like, um, you know, John goes to the shop to buy five bottles of milk. Why can't it be an actual project? Because also then you're doing the work which builds actual implementation in industry. Like I think there should be more collaboration between, but maybe, maybe you can give your thoughts. So, so I, um, the machine learning course I audited, the place I was before, they, um, it's a US university, they had a, a very open-ended project as part of their they had a course on unsupervised learning. They had a very, very open um, project. They actually, it was very open-ended, and they hosted it on Kaggle. So you can create private Kaggle competitions. And basically, these guys would fail all their other courses because they'll be competing against each other <laughs> on the Kaggle course. And that was, people got into that a lot. And I think that was an awesome way to kind of replicate that. Yeah, maybe it got a bit unhealthy, but I thought it was. Well, I'll, I'll just say, I mean, uh, one of our gracious sponsors, the guys from the Launch Lab, run a bunch of competitions, and 
we might start up one some of those and, and it was very motivating. I mean, like competition is always a good motivator and uh, yeah, that's great. I, I think there should also be more hackathons at universities. Like I, I'll talk about this at Neo one, but that should be like a monthly club and you can pull projects from industry, they can sponsor the prizes, everyone learns. I also think uh, computing should be free. Like students currently can't learn because they can't afford the computing. It's like what? Like, you know, and also, it's like that drug dealer model. The cloud service providers will have customers for life if they learn how to use this. Like, I think they should also, like every university student should be able to like do, like obviously they can't mine Bitcoin and stuff, but I think they should be able to learn. But the problem is they, they've got to pay for that and students have no money, so yeah. Maybe IBM can help sponsor. Yeah, well, IBM can sponsor. They, they, they sponsor the, 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 the vision platform. And also, yeah. and also uh, in terms of, we're running a massive internship project, uh, 10 year internship project, we hope to train hundreds of interns. Um, and um, this is specifically an equity internship. Um, and the model is uh, you come in for three or six months uh, while you're doing your, your master's or PhD or in between even. Uh, and you also have an undergraduate sponsorship program, it's not an internship. Uh, I want to make a point about, uh, about I'm a fan of edX and Coursera as well. Uh, I feel like a kid in a candy store. I can just uh, spend the whole day, weekends, watching videos. Um, but uh, there was an interesting blog I came across that said that um, they did some analysis and they showed that unfortunately it didn't play out the way you know, the dream of MOOCs, people expected it to play out, that it would, it would democratize education. And what they showed is that um, like 90% of the people who took these courses had degrees already. Because, I mean, we were we already hooked. We, we already know the value of education, and now, ooh, we've got it for free, and so we can dive in and take a, you know, take a Harvard course or MIT course, it's like the dream come true. But we, but, but you had to go through that system first. Yeah. So that still hasn't been solved. So I'm trying to get into a discussion. Somehow I feel this human element, uh, this mentorship, is, is, is crucial. Apprentice, maybe the whole apprenticeship model is a nice TED talk, one of the highest rating, rated TED talks um, yeah. on school skill creativity mm -hmm. uh, and how uh, it's like a machine, uh, it's like a um, uh, um, consumerist uh, factory line type way of uh, education being treated like a factory line. And um, uh, so we need to go back, so I see the apprenticeship and mentorship model as, as a cure for that. But then that leads to another problem, which is, uh, which is that mentors are in short supply, right? Uh, so somehow we need to solve that problem. How do we... Uh, I will say that it's like people just take note for it, like they, they want everything to come to easily. Honestly, man, I think if anyone took the effort to like email you, you may not reply straight away, but I think in most cases you would reply. But I think you know people also need to be proactive, and there are also a bunch of meetup groups. So like I help run the Kipan Deep Learning meetup. There's the Mia stuff. Uh, you know, there are a lot of people available. If you just say, hey, can I email you some questions? Most people are going to say yes. Yeah, and you can call email. Like Stefan Klaus from the Indaba said, like he called email behind the curtain and made a copy or something. You know, like. I think yeah, it's important to also reach out and be proactive and not just expect it to like happen. Oh, so if you, you, you want that, you can have the right attitude. That itself is a skill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Let, so let's let's open up for some questions. Again, you can leave if you want. I, I reckon let's just run until like 10 past 7 until we run out of questions. And then you can go to the UCT Club and we'll have some drinks and so on. So I think you had a question first. I just wanted to point out that um, my intern client today is sort of learning that the rules were incredibly well. Yeah, yeah, that's also great. Is, is James Saunders still here? That's James may have left. Yeah, they helped start it, and, and uh, he's also helping with the Kipan Deep Learning Meetup. But yeah, the Break Rules is also an incredible issue. Yeah. But these should all be in one place. It's like the data issue. Like, maybe the data is there, we just don't know where it is. Um, it would be good to have all these internships, all these initiatives in one place where people can find them. Uh, but break the rules. I mean, it is pretty well published, but uh, I'm sure some people in the show don't know about it. I guess that's, uh, from what I remember, I mean, well, it was largely computer science and not so much data science. You say it like those are different things. Okay, are you shipping it into production or are you just writing like research code in R? <laughs> 
um, who actually benefits the most from that? Is it not big industry who now has this new data? Should we not do it the other way around that any organization in Africa which is collecting data should make that data accessible to everybody else to use? Um, that governments can use that data and that people can get value from the data, not, not industry, not business. So I think you know, it's continually exhorting Africa and, and well, you know, mine our, mine us, mine our data, overseas business, not against IBM or whatever, like, you know, <laughs> uh, IBM and Google, you know, CSR creates data for Google, which is not open data. I mean, that's, to me, it doesn't sound right that, that we send it to Google when actually, you know, Google should be providing to us. IBM. Speaking of Google. Yeah, well, I mean, when I, um, it just brought a whole horror of thoughts in my mind about, even every time we, we, we form a collaboration, there's a ream of agreements that we have to sign, data, data agreements, and it's, it has to be sensitive because of, well, I mean, there's, there's personal sensitive uh, data as well that to be worried about. Uh, and then why do you have the right to mine our information? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. These, are, these are some of the issues, the how to anonymize the data. Um, but uh, there's costs involved, of course. There's costs in uh, collecting the data. It's an expensive process. We have to, that's why we have this. Uh, and finally, of it, was it 10 million rand? Use of grants, yeah. So, um, I, I think, in fact, um, I reckon that's why these big companies, including IBM, has realized that cloud is so important, uh, because that's, uh, you know, that's where the data is going to sit. But funny enough, IBM has a unique take on the cloud, we, uh, cloud data. We don't, um, we don't mine that data. We, we, we're selling this idea that your data is yours, and we do not uh, uh, benefit from it unrelated to you. I think we're the only company that makes that a strong position. But, they all, but the point is, there's always cost involved. Hosting, uh, collecting, all the cost is the, the, the value is in the data. The value is in the data. The, the, the value for products is, is in the data. So um, you're talking about a, a whole model of, of uh, economics, actually. You have to read the whole thing. We have to look at the whole new model of it, of, of economics. If you want to make it, then you can make other people do it. I think, uh, I don't know if you've taken a look at any cryptocurrency like blockchain project, but there's some interesting stuff around, like, like for example, if you read the Civic white paper, kind of almost probably South African project, I guess, we've been working on it. Um, there, you know, banks pay ridiculous amounts of money to feed the people. And so if you've already been peaked, maybe bank B can buy the speaker from bank A for less than they would pay in both ways, right? Um, but there's a lot of discussion in the paper around like being rewarded for revealing the data. So I mean, like Adrian's talk was talking about like how you may lower someone's premium if they volunteer the data, right? Um, I think I think it's conceivable that there may be a marketplace that could be made for your data where you can be rewarded for it rather than exploited. Um, so there may be a technological solution to that specifically, but, but uh, yeah, great point. Obits. Yeah. So, to your point, um, it doesn't have to be that you have to read the data for everyone, or you have to read the model for everyone. So the concept which is coming now is like decentralized and democratized AI and data. What does that mean? Everyone contributes to the data, and everyone contributes, or contributes to the model. So it's kind of on a part of blockchain, but you use the data in a form where you can only use a portion of it, and the rest of the information is not, not revealing. You train your model, and then, uh, or you give away your model, but uh, someone can utilize it, and they still say that uh, they, can, they can give their weight. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're keeping the privacy of the data and the model, but then everyone is getting benefited of that. And these things are now especially in a highlight because of the data breaches from uh, Facebook and then uh, also a lot of data going to Google. So uh, there are a lot of initiatives in this, uh, in this side from Silicon Valley, so why not we can take that initiative as well in the country that why we decentralize the data, we democratize the data and the models at least among us Stop doing that. So, so everyone, everyone heard Ovin's uh, battle cries on video as well from Absa. Maybe you heard. He's got a disclaimer, I'm sure. I think he's going to see his personal <laughs> 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 Yeah, 